This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our oral medicine series. This video is going to be about cancer as well as chemotherapy and radiation therapy to treat cancer patients. So cancer is unfortunately a major health problem around the world and for optimal oral health, the dentist should play a role on a cancer patient's healthcare team. And one such example is making sure the cancer patient maintains excellent oral hygiene, because that'll limit some of the complications associated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which are the main avenues for treatment of cancer. Now, since there's no way I can cover every cancer in this video, this will serve more as a general overview for the more common types of cancer and their treatment that may appear on the board exam. So first, let's talk about some epidemiology. Cancer is the second most common cause of death in the US, only behind heart disease. And in the entire population that's younger than age 85, cancer is actually the leading cause of death. For males, the top five cancers in order are prostate cancer, then lung, colorectal, bladder, and then finally melanoma of the skin. And the top five for women are breast cancer, then lung cancer, colorectal cancer, uterine or endometrial cancer, and thyroid cancer. So here are some questions to ask a patient you see for routine dental checkups to assess their likelihood of cancer. The first one is, have you experienced any changes in your health since your last visit? And you want to get an idea of their overall health. Uh, you can even ask things like exercise, diet, vitamin intake, tobacco and alcohol use, cancer in the family, anything like that to give you some background. Are you aware of any new lumps or bumps? So these new lesions may appear under the arm or on the neck, and if they're popping up for no apparent reason, that may be cause for further investigation and possible referral. Any lesions that are changing color, maybe changing size or changing shape. Remember, people usually see their dentist more often than their medical doctor, so it's absolutely appropriate to ask all of these questions and even discuss the benefits of cancer screening and encourage people to take advantage of them. A primary role of the dentist can be early recognition of cancer. Along with this, oral cancer screening is important to do at all patient exams, as I mentioned in the substance abuse video earlier in this oral medicine series. So head and neck cancer includes any cancer that develops in the mouth, throat, nose, lips, or any other region of the head and neck. As with all cancer, the best way to reduce morbidity is early detection of it. The earlier stage you catch it at, the better prognosis you likely will have. So part of that is conducting regular exams. This includes visual inspection and digital palpation intraorally, as well as all of the lymph node regions. And we're specifically looking for fixed or matted lymph nodes. So fixed means that they're non-movable and matted means that there's a bunch of lymph nodes that are kind of stuck together and they move together as one single unit. So what we would do is palpate the occipital, posterior auricular, and preauricular areas. We would palpate by the parotid gland and the TMJ, asking the patient to open and close. We would palpate the submandibular area. You can ask the patient to bend their chin down and put the tongue to their palate to get great access to that area. You'd palpate in front and behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle for the anterior and posterior cervical chains. And you can ask the patient to turn their head to the side and down to access that area really well. And you could also palpate the thyroid gland area. So squamous cell carcinoma is the most common cancer of the head and neck, especially in the mouth. And according to cancer.gov, the order of most common to least common areas for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma 
is oral cavity as the most common, then oropharynx, larynx, nasopharynx, and hypopharynx. And salivary glands and sinuses would also be somewhere near the end of this list. So as we just talked about, oral cancer falls under the umbrella of head and neck cancer. Now as far as risk factors for causing oral cancer, tobacco is the most dangerous, followed by alcohol, then we have human papillomavirus, and just being in general immunocompromised. Now alcohol and tobacco are synergistic with each other, meaning both of them taken together are even worse than the sum of their parts. For oral cancer, carefully visually inspect and palpate the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the lips, especially the lower lip because it gets more sun exposure, which is a risk factor for basal cell carcinoma. And remember that pink is, generally speaking, the normal color for structures of the mouth. Red can be abnormal due to erosion or blood vessels near the surface, and white can be abnormal with increased surface thickening or less vascular structures. And as far as palpation goes, smooth is normal, except for the rugae of the palate. And the order of most common to least common areas for oral cancer would be tongue, especially the posterior lateral border, the lip, especially the lower lip, and the floor of the mouth in that order. All right, so we're gonna spend quite a bit of time here talking about treatment planning modifications for cancer patients, which can be broken up into three distinct phases. That is pre-treatment evaluation and preparation of the patient before they get their cancer therapy, oral health care during their cancer therapy, and then post-treatment management of the patient. And note that these recommendations here do not necessarily apply to every cancer patient. It's much more applicable for those who are or have undergone head and neck radiation and or chemotherapy specifically to treat their cancer. So if someone had surgical excision of their cancer, for example, most of these things will not apply to them. Okay, so let's start with before cancer treatment. We want to make sure we do a comprehensive exam. So that a panoramic x-ray should be reviewed, edentulous areas should be surveyed for impacted teeth and retained root tips and any latent osseous disease. We wanna maintain excellent oral hygiene. So we would do oral hygiene instructions, encourage a healthy non-cariogenic diet we want to remove their calculus, provide a nice prophylaxis and fluoride treatment, all helping the patient reach a state of oral health. Importantly, we we'll want to eliminate all sources of irritation and infection. So this includes abscesses, gum disease, any sharp bony edges, active caries, and chronic inflammatory lesions, just to name a few. For children, this would also include removing any mobile primary teeth that are expected to be lost during chemotherapy, and gingival opercula should be surgically excised if there's risk of food impaction. We also want to remove orthodontic bands before radiation treatment because they're a source of irritation on the gums. And symptomatic non-vital teeth should be endodontically treated. Now, dental treatment of asymptomatic teeth, even with periapical involvement, can be delayed until later. And then non-restorable or questionable teeth may predispose the patient to complications like sepsis, which is systemic infection where bacteria invade the bloodstream, and osteoradionecrosis, which we'll talk about more in the next slide. So they should be extracted and removed before we get going with cancer treatment. Likewise, severe periodontal disease can cause sepsis and osteoradionecrosis. So we need to prioritize treatment of infections, extractions, and periodontal care first. And then we can move on to carious teeth, root canal therapy, and replacement of any faulty restorations, all of which should ideally be treated before head and neck radiation or chemotherapy begin. 
Okay, how about during cancer treatment? Removable prosthodontic appliances should be removed for the duration of cancer therapy to avoid irritation of the mucosa. The only exception to this would be something that is really well fitting. Now, ideally, we would have that prosthesis perfectly adapted to that patient's ridges in this before chemo radio stage, but that's not always possible. We want to manage their salivary flow with a medication like pilocarpine if needed, because low salivary flow and xerostomia that results contributes to a lot of the oral complications that we'll discuss in the next slide. And we'll also, in the next slide, talk about how to manage those. And finally, after cancer treatment is over. So we would want to first call the physician to determine their outcome, if the cancer is cured, if it's in remission, or some other outcome. And if the cancer therapy is completed, then we would place that patient on a recall program where you see them once every one to three months for the first two years, and then you could relax that back to every three to six months for the next three years after that. The more frequent recalls help you look out for recurring lesions, any latent metastases, and again, manage those pesky complications. Dental extractions in patients who had radiation therapy in the head and neck region carry many risks. Those are delayed healing, prolonged alveolar bone exposure, infection, and osteoradionecrosis. So it's prudent to consult the patient's radiologist or physician before performing any extractions. So now let's talk about complications from cancer treatment. So cancer treatment has to be very potent to effectively kill those cancer cells. So we can expect there to be a lot of unpleasant side effects. Xerostomia, as you're all familiar with, dry mouth is back again at the top of our list. So chemotherapy and radiation, that's what the C and R stand for here, damage the salivary glands, which are very sensitive to radiation. And so this reduces salivary flow. It usually starts at about the second week of treatment. Mucositis, this is a big one. So painful inflammation and ulceration of the oral mucosa. It also starts at about the second week. 40% of patients undergoing chemo or radiation will experience this. It's more common on non-keratinized tissue, so that includes buccal mucosa, labial mucosa, or the ventral tongue, for instance. It's also more common next to metallic restorations because with radiation therapy, you're getting more attenuation of the beam in that area. Younger cancer patients with higher rates of cell division and mitosis will experience more mucositis than older cancer patients. Now, things that might help uh, treat or at least manage the mucositis can include saltwater rinses, supplemental zinc, fluorhexidine rinse, oral cryotherapy, having a soft food diet, using humidified air, topical anesthetics, and analgesics. Taste alteration also appears around the second week, and this is due to a couple things. Radiation likely damages the microvilli of taste cells, leading to a generalized diminished sense of taste, and those receiving chemo chemotherapeutic agents often complain of a bitter taste in the mouth, unpleasant odors, and even aversions to certain foods. And then we have secondary infections. So during radiation and chemotherapy, patients are weakened and their saliva decreases. So they're naturally prone to secondary infection, which could be fungal, bacterial, or viral. The most common is Candida albicans. So next we have bleeding. High dose chemotherapy can suppress the bone marrow and lead to low platelet count or thrombocytopenia. So what does this mean? Well, gingival bleeding and submucosal hemorrhage like petechiae and purpura can result from minor trauma like biting your tongue by accident or even brushing your teeth. So labial mucosa, tongue, and gingiva are involved most frequently. And what you do about this is make sure you're very careful with your uh, the way you're brushing your teeth, 
uh, use topical thrombin or an antifibrinolytic rinse that can be used to help control the bleeding. Radiation caries typically begin on the labial surface of teeth near the gum line, and they progress very quickly thanks to the decreased salivary flow and the increased acidity of the saliva. Hypersensitive teeth has the same etiology as radiation caries, once again a function of radiation damage to the salivary glands. Muscle trismus refers to spasm of jaw muscles, making it hard to open the mouth. And radiation can damage the vasculature of those muscles, which leads to trismus. And patients can perform daily stretching exercises and use warm compresses to help with this. Interestingly, patients who receive enough neck irradiation are more likely to develop carotid artery atheromas, also known as calcified atherosclerotic plaques. And finally, we have osteoradionecrosis. So this is very similar to MRANGE, which is medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaws, in both appearance and etiology, except instead of a medication like bisphosphonates that inhibit bone healing, this time it's head and neck radiation that interferes with the jaw bone's ability to heal. Remember, osteonecrosis is exposed bone that fails to heal. And again, this would manifest as dead bone due to a lack of adequate blood supply, usually following an extraction or something else that leads to exposure of that bone. Like with Mrange, the mandible is more likely impacted than the maxilla and posterior regions are more commonly affected than anterior regions. Finally, let's end this video by applying this information to some examples of case questions. So when can you provide routine dental care for a patient currently undergoing chemotherapy? Now this may sound like a cop-out answer, but you can provide routine dental care when the patient feels best. And that's generally 17 to 20 days after their most recent chemotherapy session. And you can consult with their physician to confirm their blood test results if you don't already have access to them. Next, how much time should you wait after an extraction before starting chemotherapy or head and neck radiation? Remember, as the dentist, you're probably going to get a cancer patient referred to you with some clearance form, and you have to sign off on that to make sure uh, that they're ready to start their cancer treatment. So this question is asking how much time should pass after the extraction is done to allow for healing before starting this treatment. So make sure you always read these questions carefully and understand if they're asking before or after cancer treatment so you can get your timeline correct. The general guideline in this case is about seven days for chemotherapy and allow about 14 days before starting radiation. And finally, can you extract teeth on someone who had radiation therapy even 10 years ago? So osteoradionecrosis, which we just talked about, is an extremely serious complication. And very, very important, the risk does not diminish with time because damage to the bone is permanent. Unlike with medication-related osteonecrosis, where after several months of termination of that bisphosphonate or anti-angiogenic drug, the risk of osteonecrosis diminishes. After head and neck radiation, that risk never goes away. So for the rest of their life, that patient should never allow a dentist to extract a tooth without first consulting their radiologist or physician. If it's deemed absolutely necessary, you would extract one tooth at a time, be as atraumatic as possible, get primary soft tissue closure, use antibiotic coverage, hyperbaric oxygen, all of the same guidelines that were mentioned for avoiding MRANGE, you would apply those here as well. But again, that's only if you're cleared by the physician or radiologist and extraction is absolutely necessary. 
All right, so that's it for this video, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides so you can take notes on them and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.